your name came up. And they said, it's this amazing girl out of England and she's so funny. Aww. And then I remember David calling and saying that you'd gotten the part and I remember walking into the room and like turning and meeting you. And I just remember going like, hi buddy, in my head. Aww. And the instant thought, I was like, what a movie star. What? First thought, at the, like there was like, you were like shedding stardust. It was crazy. Are you getting this? <laughs> and I just remember um, thinking to myself, Emily Blunt is going to be the biggest deal. And um, then we just chatted and, uh, and we went for coffee and I took you for a walk around where so I So I will live. say, I was just talking to our mutual friend this morning, to Jen, and I was saying, you know, I was so green coming into that situation. And I said she was so kind to me. And I didn't know New York, I didn't know anyone. And you were like the warmest embrace and you were so good to me. And even though you were a colossal movie star at that time, there was, you treated me like a complete equal to you always. You were one of the people I've known longest. We've known each other for 18 years. What? What? 18 years. Our relationship is the age of an adult. It really is. We have an adult relationship. Uh, it's crazy. That, that a drone up. age. A drinking age in, in, some in England. <laughs> in we are England. so drunk in England right exactly. now. Exactly, <laughs> exactly. It was the wildest thing, and I know we just had a joy bomb of a time on that movie. It was so wild. I don't know if any of us knew it was going to become what it did. I mean, it's quoted to me every week. I don't know about you. It, yeah. it, it, it will be the movie that changed my life and you couldn't have been kinder to me, and truly, truly, because it was nerve wracking. And I mean, we were both absolutely terrified. We were, we, but that last not, street, I was, but. I was so <laughs> grateful to you, your gift of a personality, but also like your Britishness, because I found like the more nervous you get, the funnier you are. <laughs> <laughs> like, yeah, like, that's how I get myself in trouble. I make stupid <laughs> jokes. But thank God for them because, I mean, it was like, a, I love what you said, it was like a joy bomb. Yeah. Just of nonstop Mrs. Doubtfire references. Yeah. And Which now my children love. Stop. So much. Oh my gosh, they, time they is so different. They quote a run by fruiting to me. <laughs> <laughs> and, like, oh! and they try and do the voice and everything. Go on, it's do just, it for them. Oh, I saw him do it, it was a run by fruiting. <laughs> <laughs> We're in the Devil's Club it's the together, best. which is incredible. And now we're in another club together, the Christopher yeah. Nolan Club, so. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, oh yeah. Captain, <laughs> like, Captain Extraordinary. All fucking day. Yeah. The conditions were like the bluer Chris's eyes got and the blonder yeah. his hair was, and he yeah. just. I always feel with Chris's amazing. hair, I can tell when he's very happy with a take because his hair starts to dance. <laughs> he has quite expressive hair, I noticed, and I can tell, it's almost like he sort of vibrates a little bit when yes. he's really happy with the take. He's not gonna tell you that he's that happy because he's very English, and so. His version is like, happy, yeah, moving on, okay. Yeah, all right, let's go. And you're like, was it good? You know, um, I remember when I first met Robert Downey Jr. I said, you're gonna just love it so much and the screws are gonna get tightened on you so much and it's just the most focused, wonderful, unchaotic set. I said, but you're going to get some very British compliments. There will be no smoke blown up your ass and you're gonna have to be all right with it. But um, he is extraordinary. He's like a tempest of a talent encased in this completely calm or authoritative person. But he's fun, isn't he? And so warm fun. and accessible. And it's all those things that people kind of don't assume about him. I think everyone's in, very intimidated. I think very, very, very intimidated. And it's so exciting when you talk to him and you realize he's still a human being. Yeah. Having a life. And a dad. That is very real. Like a good dad. And, and a, yeah. Like we've all been on those sets where the director is like a bad dad. You know what I mean? Like a bad dad, a bad dad where, who has an ego and an agenda. And I just feel Chris is a good one. The part that blows my mind about Chris is that he, cause he is authoritative in the best sense of the word, mm. um, is how deeply he, he really listens. And he's so, so he's so present with you. Yeah, did you like how he'd stand by the camera and watch you yes. like, no monitors, no sort of yelling from the tent in a puffy coat as we're all freezing. He's there freezing with you and he's yeah. he's just watching you and he's leaning into you. you and know? it's all about the work. Yeah, completely. And the whole set is so focused on that. And yeah. I, was, I remember when I was on Dark Knight Rises, uh, one of the crew members, uh, we were just chatting one day, she's, she's got, she said, you know, I've really got imposter syndrome being here. And I said, uh, oh really? And she said, yeah, but then someone else told me, if you're on a Christopher Nolan set, that means you might be one of the three best people at your job in the world. Wow. And I thought about that and I was like, 
it's kind of true, actually. Yeah. And so yeah. I just, I mean, I remember this day, because he really expects it from everyone, you know, he really wants that kind of he excellence. He gets it. He brings he gets it. it. And he, you know, he just, the magnitude of what he is capable of, yeah. I think he just expects the same from everyone. I remember we were doing this shot around a table and it was a very difficult shot to get as the dolly's coming behind me like that. And we did it a few times and, I, and we couldn't get it. And the dolly had to come around to me and rack focus as I turned to Killian. And the whole scene's about, I'm, she's a drunken mess and everything, as per usual. And um, <laughs> again. Again. <laughs> um, and it comes around and, we, and it was just hard to get it right. And so I said, do you want me just to turn on a specific line, Chris? And he goes, no, that's not for you to worry about. He goes, because that's why I've hired, hired the best, right, Ryan? Because you're going to get it, aren't you? And Ryan on the dolly was like, <laughs> absolutely, you know. But it was just kind of that assumption that he would get it and he did get it. And it was just, I don't know, he just is, oh, I just love it. I know, it's kind of hard to express because I love what you said about the magnitude of him. Mm. And so the last thing you expect uh, so, from someone like that is that they're also kind. Oh, he's so kind. And, they're also, and they also really value kindness. And yeah. I remember there was this uh, one day we were doing a shot on um, Dark Knight Rises and he came to me beforehand, he said, now I just want you to know, the shot has lived in my head for many years. Oh God. So I'm going to be very specific about it. I'm gonna make you do it a lot, but it's not actually you. Oh. It's just because I have it in my head a certain way. Oh. And I just, I couldn't, because he didn't have to, like, I would have done it however many times he no, wanted. Course, like a thousand, a thousand more, like whatever you just to you preface need. it by saying so that you didn't shrink and start to question exactly. yourself. You exactly. Know? He's just, a, he's, a, he's, he's a wonderful, I, I get lost for words about it. I mean, we all felt that way and we're all so proud to be in it. Like we're so blown away. Can I tell you that I saw that watching the movie? Yeah. Because the movie is, the movie's the movie, and I am at a loss for words, and you are just so wonderful in it. I was so, I, I, just because I've known you for so long, I was so proud of you. Oh, thank She was so different than you. Yeah. Like, so different, and yeah. you're, you're so warm, and you're so funny, and you're just like, it's just a room is better with you in it, and she's kind of like the opposite of you. She's kind of like a dying star that, like, contracts yeah. Yeah. Um, painfully and dramatically and reacts. I feel sorry for you. Knowing you as I do, I knew that that's a stretch. <laughs> so, so the way Kitty contracts around her life, you know, rather than kind of opening to it, and then when she finally does open and you realize, oh God, the pain that she'd been in the whole time and, and sort of the indignity of yeah. her life. Yeah, that some that's of an her... amazing word to use and actually the perfect word to use and I so appreciate everything that you're saying. I can't even tell you. It's so, because you speak so beautifully and you kind of word things that even I haven't quite been able to uh, grasp about her and what it meant to play her. I did find her ferocity so exciting. I thought she was so exhilarating. I mean, he was her fourth husband by the time she was 29. Mm -hmm. Like. Clearly, she was a bit of a nonconformist for mm -hmm. the time. And that deterioration that she goes through and the indignity, as you say, of having to contort herself yeah. into something that was so unnatural mm -hmm. for that extraordinary brain and the capacity of it that was so um, straight-jacketed and squandered, really, yeah. and wasted. and. I understood the anger so much and the resentment at her lot in life, you know, and why she must have just wanted to numb it out, you know? Yeah. And the isolation and loneliness of Los Alamos, you know, she was a big party animal as well. Yeah. Yeah, she'd throw cocktail parties, but she wasn't good at the small talk. She didn't like doing it. And so she definitely got the reputation of not being terribly nice. And I understand why, but she, she was a bad mother. She wasn't, a, she did not read Good Housekeeping, you know, at all. She did she not knew subscribe. That she needed a kitchen. She knew she needed a kitchen, <laughs> but she was probably not a very good cook, but just to shake up a martini. <laughs> Where else were we going to put the ice? <laughs> where's, where's, um, the where's the freezer? I kind of fell in love with her completely and all of her ugliness. Yeah. She was also Loved very it. long ago, Mr. Rob, wasn't it? Not really. Long enough to have forgotten. Could you return the card or rip it up? The card that whose scene that I've you forgotten? talk about, the testifying scene, I saw it as that 
reclamation of that brilliant brain, like coming back to life. And when all the odds were against her and no one believed in her and she was so volatile and so unpredictable at that time, it was so exciting. It's such a cool setup that Chris gave me, you know, and it literally says in the script, she's barely walking in a straight line getting into the, and you're just like, oh my God, she's going to choke, you know. Oh, the, but, way, the way you, and the way you choke. Mm -hmm. The way you did before he gives you the glass of water. The thing I loved was I couldn't tell. You managed to make me equally believe that it was put on, she was luring them in, and that it was something that was happening and she was smart enough to know how to lean into it and use it. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. she was playing chess with the moment, but I couldn't mm -hmm. tell right off the bat if it was something that she was like, I know exactly how they see me. Mm -hmm. I know exactly where their biases are mm -hmm. and I know exactly how to play them. Yeah. I also remember in the scene, Jason Clark, who's just a great dance partner, you know, for a scene. Yes. He's so brilliant. Yes. But I remember he said to Chris, I think I'm gonna just move my chair in and I'm gonna get really close to her. And actually I remember it made me like bristle and it kind of made me go, let's roll. Mm -hmm. Like, let's do this. Do you mean so that, cool. that he, because he and the character wanted to Yeah, he wanted to space? intimidate me and invade my space. Mm -hmm. And like that thing is most women have experienced when a man tries to intimidate you. You go I up to the wall, but not through it. That's right. And it's just like, it kind of just makes you want to fight. Yeah. It was really fun. Mm -hmm. It was a very exhilarating scene. It was so fun. It looked so really, fun. really fun. So and fun. when you let this cackle out, I was like, there she is. I was so relieved. Yeah, she <laughs> probably like relieved. It was <laughs> yeah, it was, it, it was, a, it was a really, a, such a heroic moment for her. And I'm so grateful that she gets that moment because she um, had deteriorated to such an extent. It was so wonderful to give her a moment of, um, yeah. you know, soaring at the end. The whole metaphor of a star dying and what, and what Chris did uh, with the cinematographer, who was your cinematographer? Hoyta van Hoyta. It was Hoyta? Yeah. I thought it was. I know. Hoyta did Interstellar. Oh, he's and just, so he's heaven. He's heaven, he's so brilliant. I know, he is. And they're he's like great. soul twins together. Chris well, and I, So I worked with Hoyta and was Chris on the first, first one, so they must oh, be like a, so deep in love. You can tell. language stuff. You can tell it's how beautiful. in love they are oh, through he, every he, shot. I mean, Chris every time. Chris loves Hoyta more than anyone in the world, I think. <laughs> I mean, apart from Emma and his children, sorry. But, um, <laughs>